have a hare and hound race today. The hare will be balloon number 47. The event, an international gathering of hot air balloonists. The place, Tel Arad in Israel's Negev desert. The man in charge, Ingemar Lilia from Sweden, balloon master and task setter for four days of aerial competition. If the weather permits, the hare will take off at 7.15. You have to wait five minutes before taking off. And then you have half an hour. In Israel, the sight of hot air balloons is still sufficiently unusual to bring out sizable crowds. A vital consideration for Israel's first ever hot air balloonist and fiesta organizer, Gideon Abel. Uh, it all started about two years ago when uh, I thought that it would be beautiful to, be, to bring some balloons to Israel and to show the people what it's all about. And uh, the 40th anniversary of the country uh, was very close, so I came to the organization and told them, let's do it part of the, uh, the whole thing that will be in Israel in the 40th anniversary. And they accepted. We advertised uh, in, in the in UK, in Europe, and in the United States uh, about the fiesta. And then we went to Albuquerque and we spread some information between pilots that came from all over the world. And uh, last year we had 43 pilots here. This year there are 49 pilots here. It's a truly international group. They've come from the United States, from Australia, from the United Kingdom. There are three aeronauts from Hungary, 11 from Belgium, five from Poland, others from Switzerland, France and West Germany. All have been drawn to the desert by the promise of some challenging flying, by the stunning location, and some, it must be said, for the chance of winning a $5,000 first prize for the most skillful pilot. He's been given a whistle, so he's going to blow it. But with a naturally inquisitive crowd milling about, the safety aspect is no laughing matter. Just one half of this burner can throw out a lot of heat. For a pilot like Mike Kendrick from the United Kingdom, who's been chosen to fly the hair balloon in this morning's Hare and Hounds chase, it's yet another responsibility. For while welcoming a crowd, he has to be very careful that no one gets hurt. He also has to keep an eye on the weather. That means the wind is coming from here at 2,000 feet. But that's probably the fog. When this fog lifts, it'll probably change, change direction completely. And we have zero, zero 005 at 2,000 feet, which is from this direction here. And it goes right to 5,000 feet. Thank you, sir. It's the nearness of the crowd that is yet another aspect of this Tel Arad ballooning event that appeals to all the balloon pilots. In most balloon festivals, especially those held in Europe, the audiences are kept well back behind safety ropes. The hair balloon takes off. His task, to fly away five minutes before the others, land in the desert within a predetermined time period and set up a fabric cross. The other balloonists have to fly to that cross and throw a weighted marker at it. The nearest marker to the cross wins. It's as simple as that, and yet, what a marvelous place to do it in. So why here to the Negev? Gideon Abel again. Part of the arrangement that was done on the 40th anniversary is to bring people to the Negev, to the south part of the country. And uh, I was uh, looking around uh, and I saw that this location here is very good for ballooning. Tel Arad itself is a 5,000 year old city. And uh, you can go to the Dead Sea, which is a very interesting point. And you can go more south to the um, uh, to Mitzpe Ramon and uh, other parts of the Negev that are very beautiful to visit. And from 2,000 feet in the wicker basket of balloon number 47, some of that beauty is visible. But the hare's five-minute start is over, and the chase is on. 
balloons go with the wind. What makes Telarad flying special is the quality of that wind, and at different heights it blows in different directions. As a wily hare, Mike Kendrick was searching for the right wind to confuse chasing hounds. There's that wind. There's that left under. He flew on, sweeping low over one of the Bedouin farms that scratch a living out of this parched landscape, and where the sight of 50 hot air balloons must once have been as unbelievable as the land flowing with milk and honey. Hey, are you no! I'm gonna land at the end of this field here. With fields the size of national parks, landing in the Negev is generally no problem. Yet Mike was aware that most of these dust bowls are somebody's livelihood, so he aimed for a landing at the edge of them. With Mike's basket safely down, the other balloons start to line up for their approach, while the target is prepared. Some are quite close, but that tricky little left-handed wind has managed to throw this one off the scent and meters wide. Katerina Trifonov of Austria throws out her marker. For David Lydiard of England, an undignified and rule-breaking touch-and-go within the target area puts him out of the points as well. Now this is more like it, Wolfgang Jesch from Austria. And how's this for accuracy? Hans Harbers from the Netherlands flying alone and zeroing in at a beautifully controlled 10 feet above the ground. How can he miss? As retrieve crews follow their balloons across the desert, and this lady seems to be wondering where her balloon is, the competition goes on. This Boeing 747 is piloted by Kevin Meehan from England. He's missed the target this time, but can use the unusual wind conditions to go up, fly back, and down again for another try. And number 18, you see? Number 18. That's one of the three Polish balloons, but they too are wide of the target and won't score today. Neither will the only Italian pilot, Nello Charbonnier, burning hard but off course for the cross. Come on, Bill! Come on! But for the keenest competition, look no further than the Americans. Bill Spreadbury, who normally flies a giant hot air balloon in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, is right on track for the Yellow Cross. Right on target, and isn't he pleased? The Hare and Hounds is over. It's exactly 8.25 a.m., about breakfast time. And as this first act of Telarad's aerial theater comes to a close, enter stage left, five jets of the Israeli Air Force. More from them later. The drive down to the international hotels on the banks of the Dead Sea is a plummet through 2,500 feet 
and from temperatures in the 30s to something in the region of 43 Celsius. And yet it was here that Herod the Great chose to build his great fortress palace of Masada, one of the most impressive archaeological sites in Israel. The cable car is undoubtedly the easiest way to the top and also provides the best view of the only other way up, the so-called Snake Path. Masada had been fortified long before Herod came here and in the winter season millions of gallons of water were carried up this path in leather buckets to fill cisterns cut deep in the rock. At the top, a breathtaking view of the Dead Sea and Jordan in the distance and the still magnificent ruins of Herod's winter palace, its terraces cut into the rock at three levels. Below, one of the forts built by the besieging army when zealots made a last stand against the Romans in 72 AD. Determined to win, the Romans used slave labor to construct this giant ramp and eventually storm the rock. But when they broke in, they were met with silence. The thousand defenders had chosen suicide rather than fall into Roman hands. Five o'clock in the morning at 1300 feet below sea level and pilots and their crews who went to bed far too late dragged themselves out for another far too early rise. Despite a sea breeze, the temperature is in the low 80s and there is little encouragement needed to head as quickly as possible for the hills and the balloon launch site at a far more bearable 1,200 feet above sea level. It's hot, but you can breathe. It's an hour long drive from the resort hotel to Tel Arad, and dawn is well on its way by the time even the most tardy balloonist has managed to drag himself out of an air conditioned bedroom and hit the road. For those who are up, to see morning breaking over the Dead Sea is well worth the early start. For the public, the best way to book a grandstand seat for the forthcoming events is to sleep on it. Many have come here straight from last night's entertainment in nearby Arad, where the Hebrew folk festival runs concurrently with a balloon fiesta. But until the sun warms the cool morning air, a sleeping bag is definitely the best place to be. In a gathering crowd of this size, sleep is out of the question. And if the public address isn't enough, a low-level early morning call from the arm of the local air force makes sure that everyone is wide awake and ready for the day's aerial events. But before they can begin, a word about the weather. Balloon pilots, balloon pilots, please pay attention. The mounted balloons were launched now from the control tower. Weather balloons are released to show the pilots where the wind is blowing an important consideration in competition flying, where points are accumulated over the four days of the event. Mike Kendrick carefully lays out his balloon envelope. On the dusty desert floor, it's difficult to keep the brilliant colors clean. Khaki would be a more sensible choice here. And the Belgians are dressed for the occasion. Pilots keep in touch with their ground crews by radio, although in terrain as featureless as this, retrieving couldn't be more simple. Most of the chase vehicles, driven by volunteers from all over Israel, have off-road capability, and the only thing they have to avoid is driving over a field or hitting an axle-busting rock. The curious crowd love to get involved, and with so much free help being offered, it would be a little short of churlish for anyone to refuse the assistance. Balloons run on propane gas, here provided free by the event organizers, but not something to run out of once you're in the air. Burners are always fully tested before takeoff. Most balloons have two. It's comforting to know that you've got a spare engine in case something goes wrong. This rope is the crown line attached to the very top of the balloon to help keep it under control during inflation and after landing. It's not that important today. There is hardly any wind on the ground and with a large flat arena to take off from, plenty of space between the balloons. As the envelopes are filled up, 
first with cold air by a fan, which is then heated by the burner, balloon master Ingemar explains today's competition. They have a, a target uh, three kilometers uh, south from here, and it's called a judge declared goal, and the pilots are aiming, at least, for coming close to that target. The scoring area is 100 meters. From now, they have one hour uh, to reach the target and drop their marker, and then they're free to make uh, fun flights. Change passenger flying with the, the crew, with themselves, with the volunteers. Today, there's no great rush to get airborne. The more experienced pilots wait for others to make the first move. Those whose balloons carry sponsors' banners linger for maximum photographic and media exposure. All the pilots saw how the weather balloons behaved, but in the constantly changing wind conditions, the more competitive want to know if the hot air balloons will go the same way. Other pilots are here purely for the flying and the thrill of taking off in front of a large crowd. Mike Kendrick gets airborne. He's a professional balloon operator in the United Kingdom and has come to Israel to see whether there's a future for a commercial passenger carrying balloon operation. Today though, he's just another competitor. Ready and bang for that target at zero two zero now. We're not going to get enough right. But everybody's to our left yeah. So we're actually nearer to the target than anyone else at the moment. Do you think the wind is going to take you away halfway? Well it might. It might. How much how far do you have to drop it from the target? Well we, you need to drop it from as low as possible, otherwise it, it moves on the way down in the wind, the stream it does. In the event, the wind took Mike well away from the target, set up about three kilometers from the launch site. No balloons below me? No, nothing. Okay, here we go. We're descending now at 600 feet a minute. So with the competition forgotten, he takes the opportunity for some fun flying in the unusual conditions. So you see the entirely different direction that we're going on the ground. Yeah. So basically, this morning, we've gone from north to south at 3,000 feet. Yeah. But on the ground, we're going from south to the north with a little bit of easting. Despite the inhospitable climate, most of the land in the immediate vicinity of Tel Arad is under cultivation. There are little pockets of habitation dotted all over the area. Hello, Matalam. With a network of tracks between the corrugated huts of the Bedouin villages, it was no problem for Mike's chase crews to follow his flight and see where he was going to land. to the back of the basket. And no sooner had Mike landed at the edge of one field than the four-wheel drive vehicle and crew were there to help pack up the balloon. Most of the farmers have a goat or two, and if there's not a battered vehicle about, the donkey is still the most likely form of passenger transport. Yet wealth notwithstanding, these people are nothing if not hospitable. And an added bonus of the brief desert encounter, coffee and cigarettes, with the owner of the field they've landed in. Shukran. And judging by the breeze blowing through the cool tent, they hadn't landed a moment too soon. The wind was definitely freshening, and landing in such conditions, even for an experienced pilot like Mike Kendrick, is never as easy as it may look. And in any case, it was 8.25 again, 
and there was that other act waiting in the wings, the five jets of the Israeli Air Force making their way over to the arena for the next stage of the fiesta. The days flying over, pilots make their way back to the hotel, where given the wind, they hear some not entirely surprising news. We had to make a landing because we were coming to a valley and so we came down rather hard and rather fast and uh, the basket hit a rock and my leg just just went and I've broken my ankle in uh, two places. This is Hebrew, it means get well or be well. This is be well from someone else. This is one of the waitresses here. This is another nurse. Don't worry, be happy. This is, uh, have a good time in Israel. <laughs> <laughs> so no sightseeing for him. In this stark area where Lot's wife was turned into a pillar of salt and the nearby settlement of Sodom could boast the unenviable record of being the lowest habitation on earth. From the top of Mount Sodom, a panorama of the Dead Sea and the only moving thing for miles around, a dredger processing the mineral-rich waters. A misty start and another day of competition. You should carry three basket banner. Not one, not two, three. Some of you didn't yesterday. No name. Please put on three banners on your basket. The white. Today, it's an event designed for the crowd. Balloons flying in from the surrounding countryside to drop their markers on a cross set up in the middle of the arena. Number 43, Dirk de Vacher of Belgium. A pretty good effort when you remember these aircraft don't have engines, nor for that matter, rudders. Not that such navigational aids seem to be needed by the Hungarian V. Sandor. Pinpoint flying here, and his marker dropped just yards away from the cross. This is definitely the man to watch. Over the crest of the hill, another group of balloons, but they're late, their takeoff delayed by the morning mist. But it's 8.25 a.m., and the Israeli Air Force waits for nobody. suddenly doesn't seem the safest place to be anymore and with the competition time limit now over the security of Mother Earth beckons. second pass from the jets through the balloons and over the crowd. Bill Spreadbury looks anxious and Vladislav Bohild of Poland decides the car park is the best place for his balloon. As for the Israeli jets, flown by the pilots who train the fighter pilots, they're just getting warmed up. If you can't beat them, then join them. Mike Kendrick decides to take a closer look. The visibility is good enough. His blue and silver balloon, not easy to miss. And these chaps seem to know what they're doing. 
Even so, he didn't expect them to be hiding behind this particular hill, nor flying quite this low. And that was just a little too close for comfort. I've got to get out of here because we're going to get hit by that vortex. All right, it might get bumpy. OK? The expected downdraft didn't come. Just as well, perhaps, we've all heard of lead balloons. Of course, the Israelis are particularly good at flying airplanes because of the recent history of all thing. And they see the balloons as being still in the air. And the speed that they've got, they are just prepared to fly around and through them. It's, it's terrifying, but it's great fun. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Number two, hot. Number three, Number four, very hot. Number five, six, floating. The fiesta is nearly over, and the irrepressible Ingemar has decided to hold his final briefing in the sea. In fact, this is 1,300 feet below sea level, and this must be a record for the lowest pilot briefing ever held. The mineral-rich sea clings to the skin like an oil, and it takes a strong shower to wash it off. But it's highly therapeutic, and people come here from all over the world to relieve bone and skin complaints by floating in the Dead Sea. Because the sun is filtered by the extra layers of atmosphere, it's also very difficult to get sunburn. For those who prefer floating in the air, it's special in other ways. Normally in Europe, especially in Belgium, where we uh, make ballooning, it's uh, green, it's, uh, we have rivers, we have uh, cities. Here we have nothing, only desert. That's the special uh, for me and uh, the weather. Uh, over the hills there are different winds and you can uh, go by the balloon on different uh, sizes. You go to the left if you want, you can go to the right if you want. But you must look for the good wind direction to get altitude, to go to the descent and to get a good and the best wind direction to drop the marker at the target. I don't know the total numbers of people that were out there walking all over our balloons, but they were quite happy to see something that they've never seen before. And uh, Plus, I enjoy competing so very much to be with international people such as the caliber that were here uh, made it very special for me. Well, it's special because it's only the second time that it's happened. The logistical problems for the organisers are quite immense, but the Israeli people are good organisers, and I think you've seen that there's been a very well-organised meet here. And nobody was happier than the Hungarian pilot, Veg Sandor. He was to go home with a $5,000 first prize. Through an interpreter, he explains his reasons why coming to Israel was special for him. Uh, it was very fine, and here is very interesting the weather and uh, the, the place. It's very special, it's very famous. Famous indeed. And furthermore, a mere two-hour drive from the hotel to Jerusalem itself, passing the Dead Sea Scrolls Cave and Jericho on the way. But that's another story.